Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, if you're on my mailing list, you already know the lineup for the whole month. If you're not, why not subscribe? Because we have brand new way of programming this year for Chef AJ Live. Instead of doing an individual guest every day, we selected 28 people of the over 100 people that applied for a monthly slot. So the first Monday is Dr. McDougal. The first Tuesday is Dr. Lyle. Who's the first Wednesday? Well, it's a very talented chef, one of my favorite vegan chefs, as a matter of fact. And she has called her show Kathy Hester's Vegan Kitchen because her name is Kathy Hester. She's vegan and she is a wizard. And I think she should have called it something with the word wizard because she loves Harry Potter and she really is a wizard. I really do adore this lady because she is the queen of inclusivity. And by that, I mean, it doesn't matter what your dietary option is. Even if you still eat meat, even if you're eating oil, not eating oil, if you don't have an air fryer, she will find a way to make a recipe work for you, whatever your diet, whatever your budget, whatever machines you have or don't have. As a matter of fact, she's, I think, the only person that has a recipe in all three of my books because I love her recipes so much. My latest book on process is actually on sale for almost 30% off right now on Amazon. And she has a couple of recipes in here. And today she is going to be making, and perfect for this rainy weather, a vegan chicken rice soup with a chickpea option. Please welcome Kathy Hester. Yay! Yay! I'm so excited. I love Chef AJ. For those of you who don't know, I think everyone hears me talk about you all the time. You're so awesome and fun. <laughs> and I'm How just so excited to be... How did we meet? Because, you know, you're in North Carolina and I'm in California. And, you know, we we did meet in person at the Remedy Food Conference, but we we met before. And I think, you know, you, I just forgot to show your books because I you have like 11 books now, right? Yes. <laughs> I have not, not to mention your best book, the latest one, the Ninja Creamy book, which is which is your first self-publishing attempt we'll, we'll talk about because that was, I actually, not, I, I wrote the forward to that one. But yes. I, the first book I got from you, you know what, somebody borrowed the Bean book, so I don't have that. And, but let me just show your books because they're so good. You, you know, you can tell, I don't do this for the show. You can tell that when there's this, that means I either making or made the recipe, but she's got the easy vegan cookbook. She's got uh, the gluten-free cookbook for the Instant Pot. They should have paid you for using their name. Oh, this is a wonderful book. You, your sausage recipe out of oats is fantastic. I love that. Vegan cooking in the air fryer. And she always has options that you can go SOS free. And then the ultimate one, this one, actually, I remember this from Costco. I mean, this was sold in Costco. So that's a pretty big deal. It was pretty awesome. Um, and I really enjoyed doing all the books, but really what's most important to me is making sure that I can do a recipe that everyone can eat. And that's because if, if all of you guys were coming over to my table today for lunch, I would want to take care of you. And for instance, Chef AJ can't have chickpeas or soy curls. So I probably would either... Let me see, maybe get some hempe or put in some cauliflower and extra vegetables. So I've done like a cauliflower substitute. And I think it's really important when you have people coming to your house to include them, because it's a way that you're kind of sharing what you do with other people. And a lot of people tend to think things are harder than they are. And that's why I wanted to make this really easy soup for you today and I cooked up some rice just now because the rice in my fridge was too old to use but this is a great thing if you just have some it's still within date rice in your fridge but maybe it's hard maybe if you're going to use it you have to put some extra water and steam it a lot this is the perfect in use for it. Don't have rice. Do you have quinoa, bulgur, oat groats, any grain that's already cooked? And so I'm going to make this the easiest way possible so that if maybe it's, can you guys see how cloudy and dark it is here today? It's like real low key. It's not cold, but it's a little depressing. So a lot of times when it's winter or maybe we have seasonal affective disorder or 
something else is going on, you don't really want to cook and we tend to not eat so well then. But this is a recipe you can make with very little effort. Chef AJ is putting up the recipe under the YouTube video and it has instant pot and slow cooker instructions and we're going to make it on the stove top because it's just that easy. It's really, really easy. Um, for those of you who may not know what soy curls are, they look a lot like TVP. And actually, I'll put them in this big pot. This is about one and a half cups. Let me do the overhead so you can kind of see a little uh, better. Hey, Kathy, I just want to comment. You have a wonderful new do, both the color and the style. <laughs> I love it. And I, because I want, I don't want to miss the comments when they come in. Frankie says, Kathy has such good ideas. I love her recipes. And Aww. I want to tell you that I'm working. She talked to Dr. Goldhammer today and I'm working with a local immunologist. I haven't been able to eat any legumes, split peas, beans, uh, string beans, sugar snap peas. It's since, uh, early 2015 because of an actual allergy. So we're doing what's called microdosing. And it's funny that you mentioned chickpea because on January 1st, I ate one chickpea. And on January 2nd, I ate two. And today I'm going to eat four because it's January 4th with the hopes that I can uh, start eating them again. Oh, that would be so exciting. That would make me so happy. Me too, because I'm actually craving refried beans. Like now that I, I don't know why, it's like all I think about is one day that I hope I can eat them again. Dr. Goldhammer said I probably should have picked lentils instead of chickpeas, but I just picked the bean that I thought I missed the most. That makes total sense. Um, and so for those of you who are wondering, because soy curls look a lot like TVP, right? Um, but they're different they're cleaner in that they're made, they're made by Butler Foods in Oregon. They're made with non-GMO soybeans. That's their only ingredient. So they're cooked, smushed and extruded through a machine, which makes, gives them this texture. So there's not a lot of weird things that are not GMO. If you, excuse me, if you can have soy, this is okay. When you eat soy, you want to go to non-GMO and organic. Anyhow, I think everybody kind of knows that. Um, it's just cleaner, right? So these are dry. There are two ways you can use these in other foods. And if you go to healthyslowcooking.com or plantbasedinstantpot.com, I have a lot of recipes for soy curls because I really, really like them. You can either hydrate them by pouring boiling water over them then straining them a little bit, or you could use broth, or you can do like what we're doing here, and we're letting basically the liquid of the soup soak into them and make them kind of plump and juicy and chicken-like. So I have about two cups, it's really two carrots that I've just cut up rustically, which means not perfectly, and that works for me. And this is my little magic potion <laughs> thing. And then we're going to go ahead and I'm going to put about six cups of water in here, which may seem like a lot, but this is the soy curls are going to soak up some of that. I'm going to go ahead and turn on. Here we go. I have um, a new... Here, I'll go forward, give you a forward view, have a new um, burner. So I'm trying to figure out. There we go. Kathy, did, what, what did you want to be when you, when you were little? Because you, you were like such a natural teacher. Just you're, you have such a, a, a great presence and voice and calmness. Like you're so good at articulating information. Oh, thank you. Well, I was the nerdy kid that was wanting to play school. So that was part of it. I was definitely a nerdy kid. My first career was as a musician, but I taught, I've probably taught people how to do things since I was 12. So, and I used to be um, a computer instructor too, but then I get here and I'm like, oh, I forgot I had a new burner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's getting warm. So we've got our little carrots in here. And let's say this, maybe your wrists aren't so good. 
maybe you don't have the energy to, to cut up carrots today. If you had dehydrated carrots, you could put them in or shredded carrots. So I usually keep a bag or um, a container of shredded carrots so I could just throw in a bunch, not even have to think about it. Also, we could saute onion and garlic, but instead I have all these powders because I don't want to be bothered. It's perfect when you're using it in the slow cooker because then we just throw this stuff in and we walk away, right? So let me get my little measuring things and I've got my notes over here. So I've got a teaspoon and this is ground rosemary. So, you know, usually dried rosemary is the stick rosemary. And if you're not sure, you could probably do half a teaspoon. I like a lot. Um, if you're gonna use the dried with stick ones, I would use two teaspoons of it. I don't like it because it pokes me in the mouth and it irritates me. <laughs> if you wanted to do fresh rosemary, you could take like the little stem, you know, take away the thick stem and put about a tablespoon in there. We're going to do a teaspoon of dried basil, marjoram, and thyme. And so some of these, like this basil, is from my garden that I just dried. And what we're gonna do is we're putting in a base of this, but at the very end before we serve it, we're gonna taste it. And this is marjoram. And I really like marjoram. Some people don't have it. You could use maybe half a teaspoon of oregano instead. It just gives it a little bit of that herbal floral yummy flavor. And I love thyme. And when we make, I'm going to make a dried bouillon that we're going to use. We're using a lot of these same flavors because to me, that's very chickeny. So we're going to take garlic powder so that I didn't have to fool with garlic. <laughs> okay. And again, you could, I'll just kind of show you how everything's looking in there. Get that to go a little bit more. Okay, we're going to do half a teaspoon of onion powder. And then I'm just going to kind of mix that up. I'm going to see if I can get the power on this up a little bit. Yeah. So we can even bring it almost to a boil. And it's not going to look like much yet. And that's okay, but you can already see, see how some of these are starting to get a little bit bigger. And I'll give you <laughs> this in the corner. You can kind of see it's already, the colors lightening up. It's starting to kind of soak in some of that liquid. And you could use either some bouillon this is my dry bouillon, which has a lot of spices and nutritional yeast. I'm going to use about a quarter cup of it. Kathy, no I keep telling you, you got to make a company and sell it. Mm -hmm. Even if you give the recipe or sell the recipe, I'm too lazy. I'll buy it. I know. I just don't know when I can do all that. Well, outsource it like it's a Dylan. <laughs> we them... talked about it a little bit, but so far we haven't. It hasn't worked out quite right. So what we're going to do is we're going to let this kind of almost come to a boil and then we're going to simmer it. And more of this is going to be taken up. You could have also, um, let me go ahead and change the front. I'm going to put this on so it'll get a little hotter. We could have sauteed an onion, some garlic, maybe some celery, saute the carrot, then added all this in too. If you have some leftover soy curls that are already rehydrated or you want to use chickpeas, I would use about two cans of chickpeas drained, save the aquafaba or the canned liquid for other things. You can freeze it into ice cube trays, pop them out in a resealable bag. I'm really digging stasher bags and Ziploc bags right now or zip top bags. And those are reusable, so they're good for the environment. I have been putting them through the paces. And let me tell you, <laughs> they're doing good. I'm putting them in the dishwasher. I'm leaving things in them to where I have to scrub them down. So I feel good about recommending those. Also, um, 
you can use a little bit of celery seed and I'm going to add just a touch of the brown celery seed to add that kind of chicken soup, carrot, celery, onion, garlic sort of thing going on. If you hate rosemary, if you hate marjoram, leave it out. Just add some more of some other herbs, right? And so basically we're gonna cook this until the carrots are tender. And then we're gonna add rice. We're gonna add some more nutritional yeast, which is gonna help thicken it up and give it more chickeny flavor. We're gonna add our rice and some parsley. And then we can do salt or salt substitute and pepper. So it's really, really easy. So this hasn't come to a boil yet. So I'm gonna move it to the side. Does anybody have any questions about yes. this? At, 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 well, th there is a question from Mona and I actually posted the recipe under the YouTube video. And so that's why I don't really understand her question about if you saute onion and garlic, how much of each? Ah, uh, it's probably because I just said it and yeah. it's not actually in the recipe. I use half an onion minced and probably one teaspoon to two teaspoons minced garlic. It's to your taste. So if you love onion and you find that when you put in a whole onion in the soup, it's best for you, do that. The, think of this as your grandma's or great grandma's recipe. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this recipe too. Great grandma didn't go, oh, I don't have a carrot. I guess we won't eat tonight, right? So if you didn't have a carrot and you wanted to make this, you could use a parsnip. You could use turnips. You could use cut up potatoes. You could use a cut up sweet potato, right? Because grandma had what grandma had in the cellar. And that's what she picked from. Is it going to be exactly the same? No. Campbell's soup as a kid ruined generations of us <laughs> for enjoying soup for what it is. And what soup is, is a way to feed a lot of people inexpensively with less ingredients. It's great for budgets and things like that. It's also great to take something and turn it into something else. So if you had leftover pasta and you didn't have leftover rice, hello, chicken noodle soup, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but every time I go to the grocery store the past three months, all the prices have gone up. So I'm working really hard on teaching more about staples, which is why I want to show you how to make dry bullion. And in the show notes, there's a link to my dry bullion recipe and there's a link to my wet bullion recipe. And I have a slow cooker over here with it cooking and I'm going to show it to you and explain it because it's stupid simple and no one ever believes me. Actually, I could show you that before we do this. How are we doing? Okay, we're boiling. Let me get the power down. Hey, Kathy, Marianne, who's watching live, wants to know if you could describe shoy curls a little bit, the taste and texture for someone who's never had them. Sure. They don't have much of a taste. So you really need to add your own kind of flavoring in there. If you notice, there's a lot of nutritional yeast, chicken soup, chicken broth kind of seasoning, obviously all vegan that we're looking at. Um, the texture is very much like a faux chicken. Like if you've ever had soy chicken or maybe Jardin, it's, it's not as layered and thick as a chicken vegan chicken nugget, but it does have some texture. I'll pull one out and here we go. Let me look at this. I'll put one on a plate and maybe that will help. Okay, let me get a good one. Here we go. So see how that reconstituted from this to that, I can come in a little bit more too. That's as much as I can come in. So that when I take a fork and I cut this, it has some layers inside. And I don't know how much of, let's see. 
there you go. You can sort of see that a little bit. Oop, let's trying to get it in the middle. So it does have some layers, but I would say a nugget is more of like three of these stacked together. But that's exactly what it looks like. So it gives you that chew that you used to get from chicken. And I think, especially in the winter months, I'm more likely to want something like that. Another way I prepare these is in a similar broth with potatoes and big chunks of carrots, and I make a stew. So I use more of everything, about the same amount of liquid, but more like probably three cups of soy curls, a really large potato, maybe three or four carrots and eat it kind of like you would beef stew or chicken stew. You could add beefy flavor and things like that. So hopefully that helped a little bit, but like if you, if I taste it right now, it's gonna taste like my seasonings and my broth. So it tastes a little herby. Sometimes I have a recipe for air fried soy curls that are kind of like Southern fried chicken. What I do is I boil the water, I, I press them to get the water out, and then I flavor the outside. So it has all these same flavors, but on the outside. So hopefully that makes sense. Yep. Uh, there's a question from Hannah, who's named after my favorite yam. Is there a substitute for soy curls other than chickpeas? You could use tofu. You could use, I would use pressed tofu. You could use tempeh. Um, there are other products that are kind of chickeny that you could use. If you're using some, let's say you use garden strips, which are vegan, but they do have oil and they have, they have gluten and other things in there. I would cut down on the amount of water that I'm using. You could use TVP. Um, but just if you're using something that isn't going to take up that extra water, like the chickpeas, you're not going to use as much water. But really, any just about anything. Thank you. There's a question from, where did I see it? Uh, from JB. How can I find her dried bouillon recipe? Just go underneath the video. It's called show notes. Click more. And that's where everything is you need to know. Okay. And I'm going to show you this. This is the wet bouillon. I wish you guys could smell it. So this is fresh um, rosemary and thyme. And it's kind of layered, like literally, you guys see there's an onion cut up in big chunks, a couple of carrots cut up in big chunks, some celery, including the leaves. And this, if you're using the slow cooker or a Dutch oven, you don't even have to put any water in there. Cook it for four to eight hours until everything can be pureed in your... Um, blender and puree it with some nutritional yeast. I take the stems of the herbs out, but I, I ran out of my good cubes. Then what I do is I pour it in ice cube trays, let it freeze, and then I put it in a Ziploc, like the stasher bag or the zip top I was talking about. So that's one way. And today I didn't have any, which is why I'm making that. So I have my dry bouillon, when I'm in a pinch for that. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit more. I'm learning to use this along with you. <laughs> you don't need a Vitamix blender for this. I just happen to have it. So know that, and I'm gonna look at my cheat notes. I'm making a double batch because I go through this so fast. Weird. Okay, so I'm doing one cup of nutritional yeast. I'm going to do two tablespoons of dried parsley. And sometimes I'll measure it out perfectly, and sometimes I use my hand. Either way works, right? And you can tweak this to fit you better. We're going to use two teaspoons of thyme. And even if you had fresh herbs, you'd want to dry them first or they're gonna make this mixture um, wet and moldy. So you don't wanna do that. Two tablespoons, teaspoons of marjoram. 
let's see, we want to do one teaspoon of celery seed. And then we want two teaspoons of onion powder. And you can make this once a month, once a week, once a quarter, however much you want to use it. We're going to do two teaspoons of garlic powder. It could be granulated garlic or garlic powder. Same with onion. It's up to whatever you have. Got my celery seed. And then I'm going to use a half to a teaspoon of ground, a ground paprika. So that took, with me reading it off and paying better attention than usual, what, about 20 seconds to put that together. Then we're gonna blend it all together for not that long. This will work in a, a cheaper blender by far. We're just mixing it all together. And what is that? That's probably a little over a cup, which if you think of those little cubes here, and I'll, it's better to let it wait. See how everything's coming out? I'll probably be sneezing in a minute. Let me move. So see, it's just all blended together. That's it. Ta-da. Ta-da. Uh -huh. It is not any kind of magical thing. We're just mixing some stuff together ahead of time. And it's easy. That's what I want you to see. So A, it was super easy and it's super cheap. So what more do you want? Like, you know, those little packet of the cubes that have stuff in it that I don't want to eat and often oil. Those are like five and six dollars. The most expensive ingredient here was one cup of nutritional yeast which if you buy it by the pound, gosh, I haven't even tried to figure out how much it is. It's definitely under a dollar to make this. Do you have a preferred brand of nutritional yeast? I've been using Dylan's lately. Well, your world, it's uh, unfortified and it tastes really good. And I think he has a very fair price. I like, you know, I haven't met one I don't like yet. I have his and a whole bunch of others. And what I want to do is a new off on my YouTube channel. I haven't done it yet. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> fantastic. I can't wait to see that. You know, Ellen wrote a comment in the chat that she thinks jackfruit might be a good substitute for people. It that would be a perfect substitute. Thank you. It actually would because you could, what I usually do is shred it with my hands. So it looks like chicken. It does make a perfect chicken. Thank you. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah that actually, because the, the, I'm thinking about the, the, re, the forks over knives recipe I make, I use the jackfruit and it, it does have a very chicken like texture. Dee would like to know if you can make the dry bouillon without the yeast. Okay. So you could, but it's not going to give you a chickeny flavor. What you could, what you, what I would do if I just wanted an herbal, non-chickeny flavored bouillon is I would use a cup of oat, rolled oats, and probably double the amount of spices since you're not going to have any other flavors. The oats will help thicken up your soup because I have another dry bouillon that I do use oats as a base to help thicken things up. If you go to healthyslowcooking.com, I do also have a dry beefy bouillon that uses like mushroom powder and stuff like that. Um, I probably sneak in some nooch in there too. I can't remember and I don't have it in front of me. But the reason I like this, and you could also do this other um, version, the bouillon and make it a vegetable bouillon and not add in the nutritional yeast to the puree. One of the things that I end up missing is that umami chickeny flavor. And just the same way nutritional yeast brings that to, it's a weird thing. It tastes like chicken and it tastes like cheese in my brain. And I think a lot of people's brains, but you can, if you're allergic or somehow you can't have it, definitely try oats and then you might, you might go ahead and put like some mushroom powder in there, some tomato powder. 
So maybe like a tablespoon or I would start with one tablespoon of each, taste it, see if that's too strong or not strong enough and taste it again and add some more teaspoon by teaspoon. And that still would give you a great umami flavor in your soups and stews. Nice, thank you. We got, a tofu, we got a tofu question from Marianne. She says, I'm new to vegan. What are the different tofus and how would you use the different tofu and textures? Ooh, I love that. And actually, I think it's in, um, I'm, I'm gonna finish up the soup and then I'm gonna tell you about tofu, but I have a picture of all the different tofus and vegan cooking in your air fryer. So to finish up the soup, I'm gonna add my rice. And I can, if this is too thick, I can add more water. If it's too thin, I can simmer it with the lid off. But see, doesn't it already sort of look good? From, and you saw it's made out of nothing almost. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add a quarter cup more nutritional yeast. And if you don't use it, you could leave it out. This is a little eighth of a cup scoop. So I'm gonna use two of those. I find that it thickens up the broth really nicely when I add it at the end. And if you do have fortified yeast, anything we added before, those vitamins are gone. <laughs> but um, there's that. I'm going to put a little bit. Actually, I'm going to put the rest of this parsley in there. And then I could do a salt substitute. I would have put fresh in there looks nicer. But when my fresh parsley, our cilantro is about to bite the dust, but not quite, I go ahead and dehydrate it in my Breville, or if you have a cheap dehydrator, and that way you have lots of free dried. Same thing with mushrooms. What I do is I cut off the stems, dehydrate them, and grind them into powder. Oh, you know what? Speaking of mushrooms, Kathy, I, I haven't been to this restaurant yet, but there's a lot of restaurants here in the Sacramento area that actually are not only vegan, but if you tell them in advance, they'll do SOS free. And one of them, what they do as an option for people that are gluten-free, they do a noodle made out of a, a certain kind of mushroom that I guess is kind of long and strandy. I haven't tried it yet, but I heard it's oh. fat. Now, what you guys saw was I put in an herbed salt and some pepper in here, but I want to talk about this for a second too. Then I'll tell you about tofu. So the cheapest, easiest salt substitute you can make right this second, one tablespoon of onion powder, one tablespoon of garlic powder, one teaspoon of ground celery seed, mix it together, put it in your salt shaker, or your salt cellar. It really kind of mimics a lot of those salt flavors in your mouth. I have some other like more fancy ones, but in a pinch, that's what I do. And I think it's easy. It's cheap. You're not going to spend $6 on one container of a spice. So to go back and that was our soup is pretty much done. I'm going to let it keep going and we can let it um, see if the carrots, I think the carrots could go just a little bit longer. That's how we'll know the soup is ready. So let's talk about tofu for a minute. Um, there's so many different kinds of tofu, but the kind of two, to me, main categories that we see, one is silken tofu. And I think, yeah, that sometimes it's packaged like this, or you can also see that in water packages. It's, it's super silky. So I put that in a blender with the melted chocolate chips and call it chocolate mousse. It just makes these beautiful things. Also, if you're just turning vegan and you're missing scrambled eggs, add some of this smushed up into your regular scrambled tofu and it looks like whites and yellows. And so it kind of appeals to that mouth feel. So other than recipes that call for silken tofu, you probably aren't gonna use it as much. You could use it in place of an egg and baking. Um, you use it a lot of times in mapo bean curd is something you get and you see it there. Although not all mapo bean curds are silken. So then we have the others that we find at Sprouts and Whole Foods in the grocery section. 
that have water in the packages, right? So we have soft, sometimes there's medium, firm, extra firm, and super firm or high protein. So my absolute favorite tofu is the super high protein. And it's not high protein because anything was added to it. It's higher protein because more water was squeezed from it. That's it. So why do I like that better? Extra firm sounds like it would be just about the same. You have to press the, the water out of the tofu. If I'm doing a tofu scramble, I don't. I could get firm or extra firm and just squish it and cook that water off. But if I wanted to make, let's say chicken fried tofu slabs, if I just tried to cut it, it's gonna break up. So either you can have a tofu press and I have, I'll, maybe next time I'll do something on tofu. So tofu press or the old timey way, wrap it up in paper towels or clean kitchen towels, put a cast iron skillet and something else and pile some things up, let it sit for an hour or two, then that water is pressed out. So extra firm costs, or the super extra firm costs more, but you get more actual tofu per ounce. It's not all water, if that makes sense. Do you have anything you would add to that? Did yeah, I leave any I, kinds I out? like, um, you know, my favorite tofu is the Mori Nu in the boxes. I find that, um, at least especially if I'm making desserts, because, you know, silken tofu for desserts and water packed for savory. That's kind of how I roll. Yeah. And I've made things like with firm tofu, I've made pumpkin pies with it as well. But I definitely think this is just so smooth and silky, therefore silken tofu. Um, but if I was going to put tofu in here, I would have, if it was firm or extra firm, I would have pressed it and cut it into small pieces. Do you ever freeze it? You know, you know, there's that option that people do oh, yeah. change the texture and, and the, you know, the raw oh. fooders and we have, uh, Alyssa and Nate who are, have a regular slot on this show, feeling great with Lisa and Nate, the second Tuesday of the month, they do this technique and it's really quite interesting. And I, I like it where you take a fresh vegetable, like a broccoli or a cauliflower, put it in a small pieces, freeze it, defrost it. And it, it, it changes the texture. Interesting. That's very interesting. Like for me, because I learned how to cook from um, Molly Katzen's Moosewood cookbook. So I had all the Moosewoods forever. And that's how I learned about freezing tofu. Because if you, if you take firm tofu in the water, put it in your freezer as is, then take it out. It takes a long time to saw. You can squeeze the water out of it like a sponge and crumble it up and make ground beef crumbles. It gives it this really nice texture, I agree. And it's, it's kind of like TikTok in 2020 when everybody was making um, wheat gluten from wheat flour. Because that's the, I used to go back in the 70s before we could get wheat gluten powder. <laughs> this is how people used to make seitan, right? So it's kind of like everything that's old is new again. Uh, Sandra is saying silken firm tofu makes a great no egg salad. And mm -hmm. Anita Faye is saying she loves to make the liquid bouillon and freeze it in ice cube trays. Oh, hi, Anita. Yeah, the bouillon. Everybody that I know, when I made that, um, the freezer bouillon, when I started the vegan slow cooker, my very first cookbook, because back then I was still using better than bouillon, which has a lot of things in it I avoid now, but it was still going to be like $5 for a jar. I think they're like more like $8 for a jar now too. And I was like, I'm going to use my whole cookbook advance just buying bullion. So I got to fix that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. As a matter of fact, oh, okay. this, this is the toughest question in my opinion for any chef, and let me find it. I just saw it a moment ago. It was about onion and garlic. Here it is. It's from Linda. Do you have a salt substitute idea for people who can cannot eat onion and garlic? That is to me the biggest challenge because when I've had like uh, 
you know, like restaurant chefs on, you know, my, my slogan is everything starts with an onion. And then of course, garlic. And I once had to go on elimination diet for like three months and I, I couldn't eat onion and garlic. I lost so much weight there because food just doesn't taste good to me without onion. I, I So I have no clue. So what do you say? Hing or asafoetida. Hing, H-I-N-G. Can't spell asafoetida. It's an Indian spice that's used by people. There's, um, and I always forget, there's a religion that uh, does how, not. I know the, I know who you're talking about, Brahma Kumari. Thank you. And I always forget who it is. They are not allowed to eat onions and garlic because it's too stimulating. So kind of the same way Mormons don't have caffeine. So it's a very similar thing. So if you go to your Indian market or order it online on Amazon, the one thing, okay, there's a few things you need to know about hing. You're not just going to use it willy-nilly because it's very strong. Um, also, if you can't have gluten, you need to make sure that you're looking at the ingredients and getting a gluten-free version. They do exist, but they're not as common. So it's commonly just some wheat flours thrown in there to keep it from clumping. But if you go on Amazon or you can look on the ingredients in the Indian market itself. So, okay. You're going to get some hang and then you're going to start cursing me. So a couple things you need to know. It smells. I'm trying to think of the nicest way to put this. It smells perhaps like you passed gas a little bit. It does not have a pleasant, fragrant, like, you know, honestly, onion and garlic, if I just stuck my nose in here, that's not going to smell so terribly pleasant either. You're going to want to double or triple bag it if you're storing it with other spices so it doesn't infiltrate. Um, and you use like a pinch and then start from there. A pinch goes a long way. So it's not like, well, we need a whole onion and a bunch of garlic. You might need a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon of hing only or maybe even less. Thank you. You know, um, Tracy says, what's Kathy's vegan story? Uh, okay. So it's really more of my vegetarian story because that happened so much earlier. So I had been leaning towards going vegetarian in hindsight, probably from the time I was six or seven, because I would do things like my mom would make beef and noodles. So I would eat the beef out of it so I could have the noodles the way I wanted them. Right. So um, then I saw a side of beef on a hook in the grocery store and I was like, OK, done, because I was a child of the 70s. Meat and vegetables were on the styrofoam things wrapped in plastic. You didn't really have any. It's, it's not like now where people are really trying to show you more of where your food comes from and seeing things. And so when I was 18. I stopped eating meat that day. And then I probably, it's probably like 2010 when I was writing the vegan slow cooker, I went totally vegan. Um, and it was just more of like, you know, and I knew I was heading that way. And some summers I would do vegan, but it just took a little while. Did, did your, when you found, like, when did you start working with a publisher? And I'm curious, like, did they find you or did you submit a manuscript? And was it because they were looking for vegan recipes at the time? I do everything backwards, you guys. Um, and so I had wanted to do a vegan slow cooker cookbook because my friend just had a baby who was allergic to dairy. And I didn't do it for that year. <laughs> I think it was 29. So 2010, I started, I'm going to have to have a little water. Well, you're Southern, shouldn't you be having iced tea? <laughs> I should, but I don't think I need that much caffeine today. <laughs> um, but it is chock full of ice, let me assure you. Can you see? This was our Christmas present to ourselves. That's the, the good ice, the chewable ice that you get. So we've been putting it in everything. So, and what was I just talking about before that? Now I've- You do everything backwards. Cause I asked you like- the, Thank the, you, got the it. Publisher look for you because you were, were a vegan author at the time. 
So in 2010, I started my blog. Two months in, a publisher contacted me through a weird way because I had been putting up recipes on sites that don't exist now. <laughs> and they had been looking for someone to do a vegan slow cooker cookbook. So I had only been writing recipes down really for like on that blog, two months. I had had a blog for a couple of years before that that I was more just playing with. So from there, that sold really well. And I tried a whole bunch of stuff because I didn't start off knowing a lot about social media. And I just tried a bunch of things. And then the publisher hired me to help with some other people's books. Very. Have you used the same publisher for all your books? No, I've used two different publishers, Fairwind Press and um, Page Street Publishing. Do you have, you have 11 books? Do you remember the names of all of them? <laughs> Bless you. I'm so sorry. You're, I'm breathing, you're, you're I'm breathing sneez- in. Yeah, you're sneezing on the truth. Whenever I have a, <laughs> a Vincent's Table Tasty, it always makes me sneeze. Well, at least I, what happens is I always smell jalapeno powder and go into this fit. That happens every time. There's the vegan slow cooker. Then there's the revised vegan slow cooker. The great vegan bean book. Vegan slow cooking for two or just you. Um, outrageous oatmeals. Easy vegan. The ultimate vegan cookbook for your instant pot. Air fr- vegan air frying. No. Shh. Air fry. Is it vegan air frying? Cooking vegan in your air fryer. Vegan cooking. I think it's this one. Vegan cooking Cooking. air fryer. And then there's gluten-free and vegan cooking in your Instant Pot. I have a Halloween cookbook called uh, The Ghoulish Gourmet. And then I have a Ninja Creamy ebook that was part of the Ninja Creamy experience, but I'm also selling it separately now as well. Yeah. Marianne wants to know what day are your cooking club classes? I do usually right now one on a Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and one on a Saturday at 1 p.m. That's when they're taped live, but you get to watch them anytime you want if you can't go live. And in addition, if you're in Kathy's Cooking Club, because I just moved everything over to Thrivecart. There are over 90 past classes that you get access to, the, to watch the classes and get the recipes and download them for as long as you're a cooking club member. Wow. Yeah, your Ninja Creamy class was great. I attended the lives and you went like four hours. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> it's usually between two and three hours each class. But like I said, you don't have to stay for all of it. You can watch as you want to. Usually we have a really good time. People ask a lot of questions and we have fun in there. The Ninja Creamy experience is a little different because it has a bunch of pre-recorded videos, the ebook, and two live classes you get with that. And that's separate from Kathy's Cooking Club. Gonna get a, a ladle. Because this is gonna be my lunch. Mm. And see how all that is nice and thick. If it was too thick for you, you could just add some more water or broth. If it's too thin. Because honestly, we can make this into a stew if we wanted to. If it was 11 degrees like it was two weeks ago, (laughs) I'd be making this into a stew. I can tell you that. And you could add other veggies in here too. So we could add in things like, I don't know, cauliflower, green beans. Oh, a quick, another quick, easy way to do this. I don't want to cut up carrots, put in the Cheryl's favorite veggie mix is the kid veggie mix that has the green beans, carrots, and corn in it and peas. You could just take a couple of cups and put it in there. 
Right. Just want to read some comments. Joanne says, Kathy was the person who took my hand and showed me the way to tasty vegan. I needed some one to help me make my food since I don't have any vegan choices living in the Florida Keys. <laughs> and Tracy wants to know if you could please explain the Heartbeat app. Absolutely. So some people were asking me to do something off of social media. They didn't want to join Facebook just to be in my Facebook community. So <coughs> Heartbeat is not a social media app. So basically, it's if, if you've been on the internet a long time, do you remember when there used to be message threads that you could be on? It's kind of like that, but a little nicer. So that basically, I can tell you an event like next month when I'm going to be on Chef AJ, I'll put it up as an event and you'll see it. You can ask me questions. You can share recipes. You can talk to each other. In fact, it's only, <clears throat> I've only had it up for a few days, but after we get more people in, I think there's, I think there's about 300 people in there right now. And we're going to be going up from there. There's a way where you can match people by where they live. So if somebody wants to support other people or to visit with some other vegan or plant-based people where they are, I'm hoping to be able to help facilitate that a little bit too. I also can go live and do some Q and A's in there with just the people who are in the heartbeat app. So some of that's just up in the air and up for what people are really wanting. I find, I, I love my Facebook group, but I have like 10,000 people almost, and sometimes only 100 people see what I put on my Facebook group. And this is a way for everybody to be able to see things, because I'm assuming they joined my Facebook group because they wanted to see my recipes, right? So it's just another way that you can connect with me. When I moved my classes from Podia to Thrivecart, Thrivecart has a much better interface, but you can no longer ask questions through Thrivecart. So everybody who's in Kathy's Cooking Club and who's in the Ninja Creamy Experience are also getting their own sections on this Heartbeat app. So as you watch things, but let's say you don't belong to any of those, <laughs> you can still ask me questions. You could maybe ask me a question about something I did on YouTube or maybe say, hey, I need help veganizing my family's favorite X recipe, and I'll be there to help you. So that's the goal. Chef AJ's being so quiet. I know, I because I, I love watching you. The oh, Ninja Creamy, it, 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 that, you know, you're really, you could have been an engineer because you're so smart at figuring out machines. I remember when I got mine, I, I FaceTimed you because I couldn't even figure out how to put it together. And remember that time that I called you because I'm like, it was brand new and I'm like, the light's on, I broke it. And all I, I, I forgot to put the blade in. <laughs> but see, the thing is, is I forget to do all the things. That's why I can answer the questions. And like, I try to push my Ninja Creamy super hard. So I know that it's going to work for everybody else. And the, the reason I love the Ninja Creamy so much is to me, it's a revolution for whole food plant-based eaters because <laughs> we're using it in a way that it wasn't necessarily developed to be used because we're making fat-free you know, no, no oil added, sweetened with date creations. And so part of my thing was finding out that kind of adding that fiber helped make it so the blade wasn't gonna break and things like that, right? Because you can't do a solid block of ice. So it's, it's very interesting. And I, I actually have two things in uh, the freezer right now that I started filming about yesterday. So I have a lavender ice cream and a butter pecan ice cream I'm going to be making later today. That's so funny that you, somebody mentioned you on the show the other day, because on the 1st in, uh, of January, I had Thomas Allen come on just to thank him because I had done, you know, 1300 episodes and he gives two free bottles of California balsamic to every guest in the United States the first time they're on the show. So I asked him how many bottles he sent, what was the most popular flavors and what was the least popular flavor. And the least popular flavor was lavender. And I said, what the heck can you do with lavender? And people in the Ooh. chat were like, well, Kathy and Esther would know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I 
I have lavender balsamic and I love it. It's not super strong um, to me. You, here's the perfect <coughs> whole food plant-based treat. Get some sparkling water and put a little bit of lavender balsamic vinegar in there. It's amazing. There's your mocktail for the night. Gosh, I, actually, that doesn't sound too bad. I wish I hadn't given my lavender away because I never thought to try it that way. I just, I just didn't know what to do with it. Oh, you know, I love, I had a maple balsamic for a while and I would put that on a pancake and it was so good. And it wasn't like balsamic with maple syrup in it. It was a balsamic with maple flavor. Yeah. Oh, interesting. A date balsamic is very good. Thomas is still working on that flavor. Oh, I've never had that. Yeah, really good. Really good. They're, I I love vinegars. I swear they make my that would make dish. a really great ice cream. Date balls. Well, I made um, figs with fresh figs, dates, and you could put a little bit of balsamic in there. I used a little bit of vegan blue cheese which is not oil free, but I wanted to try it. it was really neat. I think doing some balsamic in there instead would give it that same kind of bite. That would be really good. Here's a question from a live viewer. What is your favorite ingredient if you want to thicken a soup after it's cooked? Two things. So I'm assuming that it's still warm. If it's still warm, I you could put a little bit of oats or oat flour in there. That works really well. You could also take some of the broth and add in some arrowroot, tapioca, organic cornstarch. All of those would work. My personal favorite, <coughs> and I do this a lot in my soups, is I add in a little bit of extra potato and I just smash it along the sides. I was going to say the same thing, like a little cooked Yukon gold. Mm -hmm. And that works magic and it thickens up really, really well. I'm trying to think of other soy curl recipes I've done. I've made soy curl chili. I've made... You any if you're starting to be vegan now, and there's any chicken dishes that you miss, soy curls are going to be the perfect replacement. Yeah. What? How many hours a day do you spend creating recipes, or just thinking about this? <laughs> Probably too much thinking about it. Not enough time creating. I would like to spend a few hours a day creating, but I think I end up spending. I don't know six or eight hours just on recipes a week, something like that. I would love to spend four hours a day just doing recipe stuff, but I have to also shoot video and shoot, write, write posts and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so everyone wants to know, is the Ninja Creamy just for ice cream? In general, you will make ice cream mostly in it. It comes from a Paco Jet, which is like a fancy Michelin star chef kind of thing that they actually let their, um, it's not copyright, what's the other thing? Um, patent go. So Ninja created something like it. So in those restaurants, they do things like if they made split pea soup, they would use it on split pea soup. They use it on pâtés to make it smooth, but the, it works in the same way. So let's say we were going to make split pea soup and we wanted the creamiest split pea soup we've ever had in our entire lives. I would make the split pea soup, cool it down, put it in a Ninja Creamy container, put it in the freezer for 24 hours, process it like it was an ice cream, let it melt, heat it up. So in general, that's too many steps to get something just a skosh creamier. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because to me, split pea soup's pretty daggone creamy on its own. But you could do things like pâtés or spreads in there as well. But you're still going to want to blend some stuff before it goes into the Ninja Creamy. So <clears throat> if you wanted to make, so I have um, a cashew pub cheese that I make. 
I would still want to puree it before I put it in the Ninja Creamy to freeze it to puree it again. You don't want to put those whole things in there. That's not what it's made for. Great. Thank you. One of the viewers is saying they are having trouble transferring to ThriveCart. They should email support at healthyslowcooking.com and Cheryl will get with you and help you individually. Thank you. And Marilyn wants to know, do you ever or have you ever used kudzu as a thickener? I know the macrobiotic chefs love to use it. <laughs> I've had some, but I've never used it in anything. I just have to be honest, but it should, you know, theoretically that should work too. Yeah, why not? And, and uh, what's the other one? Um, they, they use the macrobiotic chefs they use. Is agar, they, agar. Yeah, agar. I've used that, I think, once in cheese. Yeah. And it works good. Yeah. I like the potato idea the best. <coughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. I know that happens to me. It always happens when you're doing a cooking demo too, doesn't it? I know it's because I breathed in all of that. And we'll find out how good it is for my lungs to have <laughs> all this in there. Yep. What did Kathy think of the Atlanta Veg Fest next month? I mean, last month. Oh, it was fun. I did a milk demo and I demoed the Mio Mat. <clears throat> we demoed the Almond Cow and the Arc Mira. And the Arc Mira is like that little blue one back there, which is comparable to the Nutter. So it makes it's kind of like a personal size nut milk maker. And so <laughs> it was fun because I got to like hand out samples and I made my candy bar creamer, which is like slivered toasted almonds, oat milk, chocolate chips and dates. It's really yummy. Mm. And then we bought a bunch of stuff too. I did try some food that was not it was all vegan, obviously, but it wasn't whole food plant-based. I tried for the very first time fried banana flowers. Have what? You no, oh. I, mean, I didn't, never even heard of it. <clears throat> oh my gosh. So I, I try to avoid deep fried foods, but sometimes when I'm at a place like that, I'll go ahead and try some things because I can't get them anywhere else. When I bit into it, so it was battered and coated. It looked like white fish inside of there, the way the layers of the banana flower do. So I want to try making an air fryer version and see if that will work. Um, and we tried some smoked Beyond Burgers that were smoked in a smoker. And now, plus I want to smoke everything. So I have a have smoker. A smoker? Do you have a smoker? I have a little smoker thing that goes in your grill and then I have a stovetop smoker, but I don't smoke enough things. I was, and I love smoky foods. So there was all that, then we got t-shirts. We ate some really good food around in the area. It was really nice. And we really enjoyed being there. Nice. How, were there a lot of people? Yes. <laughs> there were enough people and it was a really big main area so it wasn't too cramped but there were a lot of people there and they had food trucks outside so it felt pretty safe eating there I really enjoyed that aspect of it as well cool I'm gonna be going to my first veg fest that you haven't done an in-person presentation since actually November of 2019 before the pandemic it was Benji Kurtz who actually is from Atlanta he did the remedy food conferences there but I'm scheduled to go to the Seattle Veg Fest uh, March not March May of this year do you think you might be going to that one I haven't been invited yet but if I was invited and I knew you were going to be there you know I'd go let's see if I next time I get invited I wish we had the same publisher because then we could we'd have to go to the same thing you know that's true. That's true. But it would be fun. Because yeah. um, I love the, the fun parts about going to a veg fest, if you haven't ever gone to one, is just to get to see all the different businesses, vendors, uh, there'll be t shirts there, there'll be ceramics and body care. So it's kind of like this really great event like that. 
If you are on a very specific diet, there will be a few places you can eat. A lot of times there is a good amount of vegan junk food there. I will I say that. I got kicked out of the Boston Veg Fest because <laughs> this was in 2011 too. There was literally nothing I could eat, like nothing, not even a piece of fruit, nothing. And all I did was joke. And I said, welcome to the Boston Cupcake Festival. Cause there was like seven cupcake vendors and it offended the organizer. So I got asked to leave and I said, well, I'm sorry, oh. I can't. It was, it was actually looking back, it was kind of hilarious, which I don't understand because the doctors they asked to speak like Gregor and Esselstyn are pretty strict, no oil guys too. So anyway, that was one of my earlier experiences. So I don't think I'll be coming back to the Boston Veg Fest. I was at the Boston Veg Fest probably a couple of years after you, but not that terribly much longer than you. And I remember because and it was right before Halloween. So they had all the Halloween cupcakes. And that is literally what I remember most about that festival. They had some with big eyeballs and all this stuff because I love Halloween. But there was a lot of junk food. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the thing is, is the organizer is not as inclusive as you, because the thing is, you know, you know what I'm saying? So if you were the organizer, there would have been something for me to eat. Here is a question from Mary. Um, let me see. Mary, does Kathy have any recipes using dried T-O-R-U-L-A? Torula? I don't know what it is. So T-O-R-U-L-A. Is it a kind of yeast? Tor tor I don't know, Mary. Could you maybe tell us what it is? T-U-L. T-O-R-U-L-A. Torulia. T-O-R-U-L-A. Tor Does anybody know what, what she's talking I about? I think it is a yeast and I'm not sure. I don't. Because that. it. <clears throat> I've never called for it specifically, but I wrote it down. So I'll kind of take a look. Um, I think I've heard of it, but I don't really know what it is. I could Google it real quick if you like. Sure. Um, what is T O R U L A? Torula. Um, any of various fungi, genus Torula, I can't pronounce it, and especially yeast that lack sexual spores, do not produce alcoholic fermentation. So I'm guessing it's a kind of yeast. What is Tor? tor I can't, why can't I speak English? Um, so yeah, it's a kind of yeast. It says it's a type of yeast that grows on wood alcohol. When deactivated and dried, it looks like a tan powder, can be packaged and smoked in health food store. Ah, interesting. It adds a smoky umami flavor to food. Hmm. <clears throat> I wonder if it's related to nutritional yeast because I don't know like the fancy scientific name for it either. Hmm. Huh. I don't know. I will look and see what I can find on Amazon and see if I can find it differently. I know, I think it's Frontier Herbs, where was doing a couple of different flavor nutritional yeast. One was smoky and one was barbecue or something. But you could do that and just make a spice blend. Your barbecue spice is delicious. Your, your DIY barbecue spice. I've made uh, it fantastic. Thank you. I... I really love making those blends. Like for me, I was trying to make something that tasted like the wise barbecue potato chips that I grew up on. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't you talk to Nick and offer it to tell him some of your, your blends? I mean, he does. I mean, I think it's just, you're keeping it to yourself. People could, I think people would buy your spices. <sighs> And, you know, they, they're dried, so it's not like it's they're, It's not like, you know, be easy to ship. It's not heavy. And it, I, I would imagine the shelf life would be very long. Yes. Yes. Just from having it at my house, it would be very long. Um, well, we'll see if more people ask me for it. We'll see if it happens. Um, I don't know what. Ah, okay. So she's saying it's a, okay. Teresa says it is a yeast and it has kind of a bacon flavor. Ah, well, now I have to try it. Yeah, because I've been asking Nick from Local Spicery to make a bacon spice. And, you know, what, what's hard about it is what bacon is, is sugar, fat, and salt. And so if you're not using those, but he's working on it, he's working on it. You know, if you could, it would be interesting to see. I don't know if California balsamic has a sweet or a maple balsamic. The one I know I used before was from just like some general regular place because if you did that 
some liquid smoke and there's a clean liquid smoke. I think it's called pure liquid smoke on Amazon that doesn't have any other ingredients, no caramel color or anything like that. And then I bet if you put some onion, um, bacon, not bacon, onion, onion, garlic. Sorry, I don't know why I said bacon. I'm trying to make it taste like bacon. Um, a little bit of mushroom powder, a little bit of tomato powder. And then if you did the lick and then put it in a dehydrator and put it in a grinder. Tomato powder is fantastic. Yeah. Just curious. What do you, do you watch anything great on any type of uh, streaming or network? I'm Gosh. curious what your taste is. I love weird scientific, like science fiction, fantasy. Do you watch sort of Stranger Things type shows? Oh, yes. We like I Stranger knew you would. That. My husband watches that when I don't watch it. The, there was one called The Paper Girls that was very interesting, too. Uh, and we watched 1899 and Dark. Those are by the same people on Netflix. Mm -hmm. They're... Dark is like very brainiac. It's like three seasons. You have to pay really good attention because there's like time travel and all this stuff. So I like things that are as far removed from reality as possible. <laughs> well, did you watch, did you watch Severance? That's pretty far removed from reality. I haven't, but I, I, it's on the list for mm -hmm. sure. Yep. That's great. I'm, I'm watching a show right now that I love because it reminds me of Downton Abbey called The Gilded Age. If we you like Downton Abbey, it's the same yeah. guy, Julian Fellows, but I just, uh, I, you know, it's always class structure, but I just, I'm enjoying it so much. Uh, question, are you a Tolkien fan? Yes. Yep. Yes. And I also love, okay, the like witchy supernatural cozy mysteries are what I read. So I, I decided at a certain point, because I used to try and read like, you know, there was a decade that I tried to read all women contemporary authors to balance out the the males that I learned about in in classes over all of my schooling and then I was like this and then one day I was like I'm reading for fun for the rest of my life wow that's great that you still <laughs> read with your eyes you know uh, uh, one of the viewers reminded me I when you have thir uh, over 1300 guests you sometimes forget but Denise said Faith Scott of get to the root used to rule ya least or however you pronounce it when she made a, a cheese on this show uh, made out of cauliflower so that's where people have heard it I think ah okay well, somebody's asking if you would put your books on bookshare format not sure what that is for the partially cited if you want to send me something that I can send to my publishers about that, because I don't have any control over those um, at Kathy Hester at gmail.com, I would be pleased to forward that. And then I will look into it for my self-published books that I have now and in the future. Cause I, I would love that. Yeah. One of the viewers is saying, what would you suggest we eat if we're craving a thin crust pizza? I've been using whole wheat matzah with organic tomato paste and spicy nutritional yeast. Before you logged on, we talked about the possibility of making pizza in the future because one of your spice blends is pepperoni spice. And I have an Italian sausage one as well and outrageous oatmeals. And actually the sausage recipe is on healthy, slow cooking. So I basically you half cook steel cut oats. So they're not going to break your tooth. Then you spread, you mix them with either a sausage spice or pepperoni spice, spread it thin on parchment paper and bake it until you can crumble it and put that on a pizza. Um, my, if you can have bread, so I'm hearing you're having matzo. So I'm assuming that you can have some gluten, like a, a tortilla is nice, a I'm still big on like snowy day pizza bagels if I have some gluten-free bagels around. But Chef AJ, don't you do something on a potato? Or is, am I thinking oh, if you're- No, you, you know what? Heather Goodwin, who's been on the show, this is in uh, my last book. She made a crust out of sweet potatoes and cauliflower. Be, I've made a cauliflower crust before. My favorite pizza crust recipe is from Julie Hansen. So if you go to Julie's Kitchenette, you can usually get that. She has 
she has a gluten-free recipe as well but the you need a gluten-free beer for it so depending on what you do and don't do that may or may not work for you but you just needed yeast for the other one and before i had to be gluten-free we made it once a week it, like literally you mix it together you live your life then you come back and roll it out and make your pizza for dinner it was so easy but matzahs are good I, one of the things I like about just having a tortilla and you can get a gluten-free tortilla is you can just put a little bit of sauce. It makes it nice and crispy. And that's one thing that I think sometimes when you're going whole food plant-based that you have to make sure that you have something a little bit crunchy or crispy in the diet because that's, it get you know, you're not having chips, you're not having tortilla chips, you're, you're eliminating some of those. So to have something a little bit crispy, crunchy is nice. Yeah. I don't know what you feel about that, Chef AJ. Yeah, you know, I, I find like, you know, because I have a dehydrator. I don't know if you dehydrate, but I make a lot of things like kale chips and I'm, I can make them totally low fat, no added fat. But by using a dehydrator, I can make crispity, crunchity snacks. Yes. Which I and love. What do you think you're going to um, make next month or is it a surprise? You don't have to tell us right now, but we look forward to having you back the first Wednesday of every month. I am super excited about this. And if anybody has some suggestions and don't forget, if, if you want to ask me something, you can always email me at kathyhester at gmail.com. Put in the subject line that you have a question for me. Um, because I get a lot of email. <laughs> if I don't answer you, it means I missed it. Not that I'm ignoring you. So email me again or go on to the Heartbeat app. If you sign up through the link, it's free and you can ask me questions there as well. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to decide what am I going to make? Sometimes yeah. it depends on what the weather's like. It's February. I think, I'll tell you what, it'll be before Valentine's Day and before Super Bowl, if that helps you out at all. Ooh, snackies. Snackies yeah. are a dessert. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Susan wants to know if you can freeze tortillas. I freeze corn tortillas all the time. And you can freeze uh, flour tortillas, gluten-free and regular as well. Oh, Marilyn says, please, Kathy, make some sweet treats. Well, you should do the Ninja Creamy stuff. Oh, my God. Make that one I love with the applesauce and the dates. I love that one. We could totally do Ninja Creamy next month. Do you think it's going to, February's too cold? Yeah, maybe for people. And Karen's saying something for Valentine's Day. Maybe maybe like one recipe for Valentine's Day, one recipe for Super Bowl. Make everybody happy. They're two days apart this year. Oh, wow. Okay. Will do. I promise. Okay. Well, I sure picked good guests. All I can tell you, I sure picked a great line. Oh, Tracy's saying tiramisu. That was my favorite dessert, but I can't have chocolate or caffeine or alcohol anymore. So how would you make a, a one that I could eat? But yeah, if anybody could, Kathy, come. Oh, here's somebody saying, can you show us how to make healthy stuff with canned pumpkin? Hmm. That's an interesting challenge. She can do anything, guys. That's the thing. Oh, I make a lot of things with canned pumpkin. Canned pumpkin's awesome. I actually, if you go to healthy, slow cooking, Dot com. I have a savory and a sweet pumpkin. I have a pumpkin hummus, which is savory. Then I have a pumpkin date dip that you can put on apples that are really delicious. Mm, yum, yum. Uh, uh, Frankie says she just signed up for your classes. The link to do that is right below in the show notes. Everything you need to know is show notes. Show notes is under YouTube video only. Oh, someone named Sharon is saying the app for Heartbeat is not available in Canada. Really? That's what she's saying. Okay, I will check into that. That was not my understanding. She'll find out. I, actually, I know Brandy Bloggins got on and so did Linda. They are both in Canada. Mm -hmm. So now there is, you can go to it on your browser. Are there apps you can download for either Android phone? or iPhone or your computer. So maybe try the browser instead of downloading an app. So you'd wanna go on your laptop or your regular computer. Cause I know at least three people in Canada that did join yesterday. Well, that's that doesn't mean you're wrong though. It could be that one of those apps aren't available in Canada. Okay, well, this was a lot of fun, Kathy. Always. I always love hanging out with you. 
Yep, absolutely. I look forward to whatever you come up with next month. And enjoy your soup and enjoy your lunch. Thanks. Thanks for making lunch with me, you guys. I'll talk <laughs> to you next month. Thank you. So thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We have a bonus show in about 90 minutes with Andrew Mellon. He is known as the most organized man in America. So if you need help decluttering, please come back at two. And for our regular programming tomorrow at 11, we have the wonderful New York based plant-based dermatologist, Dr. Jessica Krant. When we have doctors, we cannot accept questions from the chat. It's not possible. So please get those in in advance by subscribing to chefaj.com and answering the email that we send every Saturday with what your questions is. If you like what you saw and heard, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing. We really appreciate it. Take care, everyone.